and welcome to another episode of the Haskin Cast podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, and I am here with a, a little bit of a different episode this week. Uh, we're going to review an episode of Three's Company, and with me is my very common returning guest, basically a co-host at this point, John Matola. John, how are you? Hey, what's up, Scott? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing very well. Of course, John is from the Deep Purple podcast. And uh, my second guest, no stranger to podcasts whatsoever, from the grandfather of all podcasts, the uh, Pot of Thunder show, we have Chris L. Chris, what's going on? Not much. Feeling like a grandfather lately, having turned uh, 56 uh, a little more than a month ago. So I will belated happy birthday. Be, way too old to be engaging in such buffoonery but here i am <laughs> but it, it it's it keeps you young i think it does uh, yeah that's no. that's that's my story and i'm sticking to it so. <laughs> well you yeah. guys on on pot of thunder just to give everybody an idea for the two or three people on earth who don't know the show uh it is a it started out as a kiss podcast you guys blew through the entire kiss catalog uh the way that i did with uriah heap on my other show and now you guys are just kind of Picking songs here and there, it's really interesting because you never know what you're going to get. Does that keep it exciting for you, too? Yeah, I think so. I, I think um, yeah, after 290 episodes about Kiss and uh, how many, however, however many years that was, six and a half or something like that, you get a little uh, burnt out on it. So it's good to get the, the, the variety um, and ideally cast a wider net so you're reaching out to fan bases of other bands and stuff but but yeah we're, we're all into uh into the variety of it that it that presents us because like i said by the by the end of the run we were all we kind of had it with kiss <laughs> to be honest with you <laughs> it's a lot of episodes over a long period of time you know it is and what i've been saying lately since this is our 10th anniversary year it's like you know when when Andy came up with the idea to review uh, or analyze every Kiss song they ever did, you know our attitude is like, yeah, sure, why not? You know, thinking that we'd do five episodes, we get bored with it, realize nobody was listening. So yeah, why not shoot for the moon like that? And uh, ended up uh, drawing in some people who liked the show, and we we followed through with it. So. Excellent. Well, I'm glad it worked out for you guys. It's an excellent podcast. I've listened to a number of episodes myself. And of course, another show I'm no stranger to is the Deep Purple podcast. I've been a guest on that one a few times. John, how are things going in the Deep Purple camp? It's uh, it's about to get really exciting for you next month. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, heading out with um, my uh, co-host and um, Hall of Famer, Rich, to uh, see two Deep Purple shows. And um um, I think Philly and uh, somewhere in Jersey. So, right. and, yep. Rich... and and again, um, it, it seems to be a tradition. Last year we went to uh, we went down to um, uh, down to Fort Lauderdale and then uh, St. Pete's. It was on my birthday, and one of the shows is going to be on my birthday again next month. So, it's like it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> we were just like. Yeah, let's go to the uh, let's start the tradition of seeing Deep Purple on John's birthday. I'm like, hey, I'm not going to complain. So it's, it's a great gift. And uh, of course, you got yeah. to uh, to hang out with with Roger last time and Ian Pace, which is uh, just amazing. And uh, I, I don't know what will air first, but I was recently a guest on a back to back episode of the Deep Purple podcast. Very excited to uh, to hear that air talking mm. about. Well, I can't talk, I can't say what it is. I won't say what it is because I don't know if this will air first or not. <laughs> <laughs> and I like the excitement of having no idea what's going to show up in my uh, podcast feed on Sunday night. So I uh, I will shut the hell up. But today we're talking about something different. I've done a couple of TV show reviews, but today we're going to talk about season six, episode 25 of Three's Company, the wonderful show that we all grew up on. This episode is called Up in the Air. It was uh, It aired on May 4th, 1982. So we're talking like but 21 years now, almost, that uh, it's been since it aired. Written by Shelley Zellman, Don Nickel, and Michael Ross. Directed by Dave Powers. Don't know who any of those people are. But, of course, it stars John Ritter, Joyce Duet, and Priscilla Barnes. No Mr. Furley in this episode. I was a little disappointed on that. How did you guys, uh, how do you survive an episode without a Mr. Furley cameo? 
you know, I, I never mean, even realized that, he, that, that there was no landlord in this episode to mention it just now. Um, yeah, I just, uh, you know, there, there's a few episodes where some of the characters aren't present. And I think that's true of uh, you know, TV shows in general. But yeah, to be honest, I never even realized he wasn't uh, in this show. But well, that's yeah. because there's so much other stuff going on and just mm-hmm. such it's such an iconic episode of television not just for the the show but for a television as a whole in my mm. opinion absolutely yeah and i i have to yeah. apologize to john ritter too because because of this show i really thought that he was a one-trick pony i thought you know he's he's an okay actor but it's like pratt falls and you know uh that was was pretty much his shtick and it really wasn't until i saw him i think in uh it was either Ally McBeal or or the miniseries of of It by Stephen King, where I thought, wow, this guy, he's got some chops. And, and so, you know, of course, I can't apologize to him now. John, how did you feel? It's it's a pretty sparse episode for cast. Even Terry's not in it that much. Yeah, I mean, you really, there's there's so much, it makes up for, for it in so many other ways that uh, you don't even think about it because it's not, it's not, uh, it's one of the episodes that's not centered on, um, the goings on in the apartment or the regal beagle or your, your the the usual haunts um that the, i would say like um i was surprised at how quickly the episode moved because i've watched it a bunch of times in, in preparation i never get sick of it and i mean i am amazed at how much i still laugh out loud at, at all of it uh like i've never seen it before but i think over half the episode takes place at the at the party Mm-hmm. Um, if not, it may be a little bit more than half. So, I mean, yeah, there's no, there's no, uh, regular characters in there. I, I don't think that they're, they're necessary. Like when you said, Mr. Furley, I barely uh, like, was just like, oh yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't in this one. Um, but I mean, what a, what a classic episode. I, I can't wait to talk about it. Well, and and it's filled in with all these really colorful party guests that that uh, Jack has the uh, has moments with that are are just. I, and this is the I would say the quintessential Jack episode of all Three's Company, uh, and and of course I mean it's I I don't interact with people a lot these days, so I don't know if this kind of stuff still goes on. But thinking about it as a general theme in Three's Company and some of the other shows back then, it's like people didn't just have conversations and talk about issues. It's plotting and scheming and let me try and you know make this person jealous by making it look like I'm with somebody else and and it's always over some crazy confusion that none of it ever would have been necessary if they just knew what was really going on in the first place it it seems to really be the foundation of the show uh would you agree with that Chris yeah I mean if you uh inject uh total uh honesty into the characters you don't have a show in three's company I mean you've got uh this constant chicanery, misunderstood, overheard conversations, just, uh, you know, all of the catalysts for the uh, for the plot lines are essentially based on deceit. I mean, you can you can trace it all the way back to the beginning where he's got a lie to Roper that he's gay in order to live with these two girls. So li- really the premise of everything in these characters is rooted in, in, in deceit and uh it kind of it, it carries through, you know, as we're as we're talking about here into season six and beyond, mm-hmm. and just uh, you know, it's really the driver of the plot line for most of the most of the best episodes. I usually uh, joke around with people and say, "Did you ever see that episode of Three's Company where there was a misunderstanding about something?" <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, right. You know, exactly. and, and and you mentioned the Ropers. I I just watched um, a, an interview with Norman Fell not too long ago, who played Mister Roper, and apparently when they agreed to do the spinoff for the Ropers, and this is coming from him, they were promised if it didn't work out, they would be allowed to return to Three's Company, and so they they weren't really risking anything. And of course, the show did not do very well at all. And he said, okay, let's, you know, this isn't going to work. Let, let's go back to Three's Company. And they said, yeah, we can't do that now. And so they they just got completely screwed. And, and I felt bad. I think they were limited characters. I think that they kind of burnt themselves out. You know, there wasn't really any growth or development. It was a, you know, we get the joke over and over. Um, but I felt kind of bad because just like the people on Gilligan's Island, they just kind of got screwed and uh, and it's a shame. But this is a very uh, physical comedy heavy episode. Uh, what do you think about that, John? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, Chris and I have had a lot of uh, conversations about this episode, um, uh, texting back and forth about it, how how, how brilliant it is. Um, I mean, th- there are a lot of uh, crazy physical things that go on and uh, on the the show as a as a whole. But I mean, uh, the the uh, the most of them happens i think the most classic happens at the at the party of course the big uh dance sequence which we'll uh talk about and everything surrounding it is, is just some of the the best stuff that he's done and um when i started watching it like when did we start talking about uh like a few months ago maybe and um i started watching some episodes and chris and i would actually swap like hey i saw this one today or remember this one and um, and after seeing the up in the air episode and watching some of the other ones from around that time or even earlier, I was, I, oh yeah, I remember seeing this one and the, the physical gags and everything were still great. They were still funny, but none of them hit me the way this one did, which is why I think it's such a classic episode, um, of slapstick and some of, uh, John Ritter's best work. I would agree with that. And, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I imagine that there are forums that talk about this and uh, probably arguments that have ensued, but I, I really liked the Terry era of the show. I think by mm. then they were in their, they were in their groove. They had defined who they were as characters. The first season was kind of really different because Chrissy was not as dumb as she became by season two. Um, Janet was very kind of frumpy. And then when she changed her hairstyle and seemed to be more confident as a, as an actor, um, the first season is really like a whole pilot, you know, and then from there, like season two, it got better. But I really think once Terry joined the cast, I think that was the most cohesive time on the show. Uh, Chris, I see you nodding. Do you, do you feel the same? Um, I like all the eras. I think, um, you know, tying us back into, uh, you know, definitely John's podcast and pro- probably yours as well. I'm not um, familiar, super familiar with Uriah Heap, but I do know that they underwent, you know, personnel changes. And so, so you learn to appreciate the, the, the chemistry between, you know, different lineups, so to speak. And, um, you know, I like it all. Um, I've even, I've, I've talked to John about this, that over the years, I've actually been my favorite era is the Cindy era mm. because I think it's a stroke of genius that they bring in this clumsy, you know, uh, blonde who, uh, you know, takes the, the dumb blonde uh, concept and it translates into a physical thing. And it's strictly uh, most of, if not all of it is a catalyst for Ritter's physical comedy. And uh, the fact that they, saw that as an opportunity to introduce a character who's mainly there to create situations where John Ritter is able to do his, you know, slapstick uh, physical comedy and pratfalls was just a stroke of genius, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I have to wonder if at some point it was uh, if if Erica Varga auditioned and Jill and Turner came in and put a stop to it. <laughs> I think Erica Varga probably inspired the evolution of Janet's look over the years. Uh, <laughs> her, her, her evolution from frumpy to uh, pretty hot in the mid mid uh, mid period. I think toward the end, it she got a little. Uh, you know, mom like, uh, hmm. just to, for lack of a better term, but when she had the super short, almost spiky hair and was always wearing the the painted on Gloria Vanderbilt, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you can tell you can tell how much I paid attention to, to her uh, <laughs> with my description, but uh, yes, <laughs> she was up there. She was on. She was on par with the the whatever bombshell she was uh, uh, paired up with in any era. So. I, I do think, though, that her evolution a, as a character uh, was probably the most realistic. I don't, you know, Jack had his like points where all of a sudden he's a little more mature, uh, especially towards the end when Vicky came along before their spinoff. But I, I think as a progression, his character didn't really grow a lot. He just did different things, but he was still that same guy. Whereas Janet, I kind of feel like she learned and matured and got older um, but she was in like the people that you're around influence you into still being kind of a, 
you know, a, a mm-hmm. little bit of a, a, a youthful person. Um, John, how did you feel like the overall progression of the show with the different uh, lineups? I mean, I I don't know if this is like a hot take or not, but I mean, I think that the the Terry era is probably uh, one of my favorites. Um, I mean, uh, I I uh, to Chris's point, I um, like I, I get if you're talking about different eras, the lineups of bands, you could you have your favorite, but you can find something that you like in each one. Right. Uh, those early episodes with uh, with um, with Chrissy were a classic, and the Ropers, and they were great. But I find um, that when they switched up to uh, Don Knotts as the landlord, Mister Furley, and then they got in. Um, they got in Terry as another roommate and they made the, the landlord is it kind of still had this uh, kind of um, bumbling comedic uh, type of thing, but in a different way than the Ropers did, but they changed up the dynamic of the trio because instead of putting a dumb blonde in there, they had two roommates that were kind of uh, smart and savvy Mm -hmm. Um, instead of having like this Janet, who was the more sensible one. And then Chrissy, who was like the, the dumb one. And then Jack, like I, I kind of liked that dynamic between all of them. For some reason, like you know, Terry being a little more uh, kind of street smart and savvy worked for some reason. And, and you would think it wouldn't because they're just like, well, I got to replace one dumb character with another one. Mm-hmm. And they did that with Cindy, which was uh, was definitely different than what they did with Chrissy because she was always beating the shit out of Jack by accident. <laughs> it was like, right. and it was great. Um, but um, yeah, I think the Terry years were probably some of my favorites because by that time too, the show was so fleshed out and developed. And like those early years seemed kind of like they were finding their way um, a lot of the time. And, um, you know, I, I kind of like things um, uh, a lot more when they're uh, developed. But I mean, um, I, I do enjoy all eras, but that's got to be my favorite. You know, that that season six is probably the sweet spot uh, for me. Yeah, I, I feel like it came together for me in a lot of ways, too. Uh, for this episode, though, up in the air, the uh, the synopsis is that Jack escorts Janet to a dull private party. And I'm going to argue with that because I don't think that party was dull at all. Uh, but when Jack <laughs> consumes a tranquilizer and alcohol, he becomes the life of the party. Um, that I agree with. <laughs> I think that's a that's a pretty good synopsis. Uh, overall, what what would you say, Chris, about just thinking like, how would you explain the show to somebody? The show or the episode? This episode. Well, I mean, I think that's an it's an accurate synopsis. But but the thing the thing that uh, you know, I talked about Cindy being a catalyst for something. The, the, the linchpin of this episode, of course, is Larry because he's the guy who shows up with the pills. You know, we've all we've all had that friend who's like, yeah, I got something for you, and you know, whips out a. Uh, a prescription bottle and who knows what's in it, but you're just like, yeah, I'll try one of those. Why not? You know? And, and again, it's in Larry is another a constant character who, uh, you know, was present throughout the entire run. One of the most underrated characters in TV history. Yeah. And um, he's really the one who sets this, sets off this whole thing. You know, he's just, and, and, who wouldn't expect Larry to be the guy with the pills when Jack is like, yeah, I got to get on this puddle jumper and I'm nervous about it. And, and of course they both uh, ignore Terry's uh, advice or warning not to take medication that isn't prescribed to you. Of course she is a legitimate medical professional and, Jack and Larry listen to her spiel and then just proceed to completely ignore it. And, uh, you know, the the scene where Larry's on his way out of the apartment and just flips Jack the bottle and uh, and then you're off to the races at that point. But, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, this is as much a Larry episode as uh, as uh, as anything else, because he's he sets the whole thing in motion. I mean, you, you you, you could even equate it to, say full metal jacket where the first half of it is so different from the second half but yeah it's the first half that sets everything in motion that happens in the second half and uh you know you got to tip your hat to richard klein and and the larry character here because uh it's really he's the guy who gets everything started in this one 
as he has on so many episodes, just been the pivotal point, you know, but, but, you know, I was just thinking about it as you were saying that, and it, it dawned on me, um, there's a, a show, uh, a channel on YouTube that I absolutely love called Zach Morris is trash. And it just basically goes through all these different episodes of Saved by the Bell. And it shows, you know, the, the, problem is not Zach. The problem is that people keep trusting him every time he says he wants to, like, how dumb can you be? And I have to think, after all the things that Larry has done over the first, you know, almost six full seasons, why would Jack take a pill from him and go, I'm sure Larry's right this time. I'm sure, you know, you have to have that to get the episode, but there's that outside part of me that goes, dude, come on. Like, really, would you trust this guy after everything he's done to you? You know, what do you think, John? I mean, I, I think that um, the 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 whole show, you have to suspend your disbelief about everything mm-hmm. because um, I, cause I, I, I've been thinking about it uh, quite a bit um, since I started getting back into the show. And like not a lot of stuff makes sense. Like what I mean, one of the f- most fun things is going through a lot of the uh, kind of uh, things that don't make sense, like the 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 um the, the the plot holes that are just like why would like why would this happen uh like for like why would why would jack listen to anything that larry says right why wouldn't he listen to terry who is like uh who is a registered nurse telling him not to take medication um why why would janet be interested in that how, first of all how does this guy um what was his name philip philip i think yeah yeah why why would like Philip, like this guy that's got enough money to have a private island, like walk into her flower shop, see her working in a floral shop, and assume that she's rich enough to to come to this party and be with him, and then ask it uh, ask her to bring a date. And then she's dumb enough to be like, Well, I really like him, but he's like wants me to bring a date. So obviously he's taken, but I'm gonna go anyways because I because I really like him. Like, how, how does that make any sense? Like whatsoever in the real world. If somebody said that to me, I'd be like, screw you, I'm not coming to your party. That's that's an excellent point. And and I'll say, uh a few years ago, the the first time that I had the pleasure of going to the NAM show in Anaheim, I was at my hotel, I woke up early and I just flipped the TV on. And Gilligan's Island was on. And I hadn't yeah. seen an episode of Gilligan's Island in probably 20 years. And I thought, oh, this will be fun, you know. So I'm like five minutes in, I thought, what the hell did I ever find entertaining <laughs> about this show? I can't, I mean, it's so bad, but I can go back and watch an episode of Three's Company, even with all that, yeah. and still just be completely entertained. It's when I'm done watching the show and I start thinking about things a little too much that I'm like, okay, now I'm going to break it down in my head and be, you know, that, that overthinker that I don't need to be. I just need to shut myself off, get in the boat, take the journey and enjoy it. Well, exactly. Because I mean, uh, the, the, the whole show, including this episode is just like fast food, right? It's like, you, you know, you know what it is. If you go in knowing what it is, if you go in and you're, you're expecting this well-written uh, highbrow uh, comedy then you're going to be disappointed. And that's one reason why I really pushed the show aside for so many years when I grew up, because when I was a kid, I loved it because I thought it was hilarious. But then mm-hmm. I grew up, and I'm like, oh, this is stupid. I thought that I legitimately thought that they were terrible actors and that the, you know, the the storylines were fluff and everything. But that's what the show was meant to be. Like they, these people were great actors. Like I didn't realize that Ritter was like a, a comedy slapstick, uh, physical comedy genius. I didn't realize that these guys were like overacting or acting for that way for the show because it was intended to be farce. It was intended to be that ridiculous. Like the character of Larry is is so ridiculous or Mr. Furley and his face is Lana. Like, you know, all the 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 dates that come along, like just the, the really just kind of over-exaggerated uh, motions and storylines, that's how it was meant to be. And when I realized that, I was able to enjoy the show a lot more as an adult. Right. And I love that they made Larry a used car salesman because the, you know, the trope about <laughs> yeah. untrustworthy car salesman. And then he's yeah. the guy that's always pulling a scheme or trying to, you know, convince somebody to do something they shouldn't. Um so you guys know, I mean, I watched the episode a couple of times and I, I hadn't seen it in years, but you guys know the episode way better. So Chris, I'm going to start with you. Why don't you take us through the opening of Janet coming in and getting the whole premise of the show started? Well, like we talked about, it's, um, you know, somebody just uh, 
happened into the flower shop and wants you to come to the party, but you should bring a guest and doesn't she does she's not sure what that means, if the guy's interested in her or what or and then um, you know, Jack has to uh you know step in and be that that date. So um you know like like John pointed out, it's it's definitely a, a, a convoluted storyline. It just, you know, seems again they that they just force something to work in order to make everything else in the episode work so right. but by by season six you're almost you're kind of used to that in mm-hmm. fact you, you know you're watching as john said a, a sus- suspension of disbelief is absolutely necessary in in watching this show you know it's uh it's just you know they have reasonable expectations and and they 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 will be exceeded by you know the, the quality of the show for what it is and the, the nuance of the show for what it is but yeah. by season six you, you kind of know what to expect and and you're almost you're almost like appreciating how hackneyed the story is because you're you start anticipating what all these weird occurrences are going to unfold into later in the episode right and and i love the way that they kind of rope jack into this where they start talking about him as if he's not even in the room they're like he could work and they start looking him over as if they've never seen him before and he's like what are you talking about because again we 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 can't have that dialogue and say hey so janet's got a situation and instead they have to you know not tell him what's going on uh, so that they can build a little more tension the way this show is crafted in that light is so well done you know, uh, so he's like, OK, you know, of course, I'm going to help my friend out who doesn't want to go to a private island and a big right. party until he finds out, of course, now it, it triggers his fear of flying. So, uh, John, why don't you take us through the next part? Um, so one of one of my favorite parts in the um, I, I see new things all the time. I, I like when Terry like says, oh, he's got a nice smile and she taps his teeth and you can hear her tapping his teeth with her fingernail. <laughs> I never noticed that until like the last time I watched it. Um, but um, I, I did want to, uh, I'll probably, I'll call back to something in the beginning uh, later. Um, but uh, I also made a mistake. It's not Philip. It was David. Oh, David. Okay. Yes. David played by the uh, great Barry Williams, AKA Greg Brady. Yes. Which I didn't know until years later. Mm. Um, but um, everything like everything in this episode is, over the top or up in the air as, as it may be. Um, so, um, I think that one of the things that I noticed too, is, is that between all of this silliness is that Jack's willingness to, uh, he either feels this obligation, like the girls are going to be mad at him, or he's just such a great friend that he's willing to <laughs> risk his health, uh, and his life, uh, and face his fears, um, somewhat to go on this, one engine plane um for janet for his friend and i mean if you look at it that way it's kind of sweet you know it's kind of like uh you know just uh, the the friendship element in there because you know these guys are always you know palling around at the end of the episode when uh you know the the end of the episodes where they're always like hugging you know a little group hug or something like that so that's uh that's kind of nice well, it's either uh, that or they're there. throwing pillows at Jack and kicking him out of the girls' room or <laughs> exactly. something. But, but yeah, here, something and, like that. And, and here again, uh, and you wouldn't have an episode without this, but it's like Jack didn't feel comfortable enough to say, hey, guys, I mean, I, I'd love to help you out, but I'm really terrified of flying. If it, Maybe if you can't find someone else or why don't you ask Larry? You know, like that would have been, I think, a more normal solution. But, it, but then that wouldn't be three's company because they well, could we, never yeah. they could never trust each other with the truth. Or be well, he tried to trick Larry other. into it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, exactly. Like, hey, how would you like to take Janet to a private party, and then he'll make up some excuse? But I think that speaks to one of the things that's kind of very, um, I guess, dated or of the time. Um, one of the themes in this episode, which is that um, I think he didn't want to. He didn't want to tell them. Well, I, I'm afraid of flying. I have a fear of flying, and you wonder. Well, why is he afraid to tell him? It's because, you know, I'm I'm a man, you know, I have to be I have to be tough. I'm not going to admit that I have any any fears or, uh, uh, you know, any weak spots. It's the same way that when they get to the party and and Janet's like, don't tell him you're a chef because I'm 
I'm, I'm assuming around that time, the early eighties, being a chef was not as a, um, you know, uh, like a position that was considered as prestigious as it was when, you know, the food network hit. And then all of a sudden it's just, you know, in vogue to be a celebrity chef and things like that. Um, mm. so I think that's one of those themes that's, you know, kind of dated back to the time is, is that he has this masculine pride that he, he, you know, he'd rather drug himself up and, and go through with it than admit that he's afraid to fly. So, you know, Larry decides that he's going to play psychiatrist here and he's like, all right, we're going to do a little, we're going to do a little role play here or whatever. And, you know, takes him up into the, you know, shows him what a plane is like by sitting him in the chair and, you know, rocking it around and everything like that, which is a, you know, a, a cool little gag until he realizes he's in the air and then he lunges out of the chair and kicks it. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's when he he realizes like, OK, he's not, you know, he's not going to do this. And he's like, oh, I guess you're not cured. And I'm like, yeah, no, not two minutes, Larry. Come on. And that and that scene actually reminded me uh, on uh, Family Ties when they were teaching teeny others how to drive and they set the kitchen chairs out in the, in the kitchen and she's in the front and, you know, her father's just everything. He's just yelling at her, you know, because, of course, he's he's an animal and, and she's not she doesn't see that they're in the kitchen, you know. Uh, but, you know, you you really bring up a good point because there there was a huge level of machoism in television mm -hmm. back then do you what do you recall chris I, I mean thinking of other shows too it's it's like you weren't allowed to as a man you weren't supposed to show emotion you were supposed to be the problem solver uh the guy that came in and saved the girl no matter what uh do i have did, am i thinking wrong about that time um no i don't think so i mean i was uh yeah i remember Watching Three's Company in real time when it came out, if I recall correctly, it was on Tuesday nights on ABC at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And, um, oh. you know, around that time, there were also a lot of uh, <clears throat> a lot of cop shows on, like I, of the time I was I would remember Chips and SWAT and uh, the Rookies and all this kind of stuff. Um, and. Um, yeah, in addition to the other sitcoms, but yeah, I just think you know, in the at the tail end of the uh, disco era and moving into the eighties, it was you know definitely a lot of uh, jungle maleness, for lack of a better term, that the term that we use often on the show. Uh, just uh, yeah, there wasn't was it wasn't a lot of sensitive guys being portrayed on uh, on television, and, and and that was one of the I mean. Uh, offhand, I can't. I mean, even though it was a ruse, I can't think of any uh show that really had a predominantly uh or overtly gay character, um, even around that time. Like I said, yeah. even though it was all a facade, you know, it was definitely a uh, a uh a significant element of the plot lines and stuff like that, and um. You know, you know, and some of the uh, just the perceptions of gay people, which are depicted and, you know, you watch them now and like, you know, uh, some of the things Furley and Roper would say to Jack is quite, quite frankly, I'm, I'm even surprised that when they show the reruns nowadays that they even keep that stuff in, you know, right. <laughs> even just the karate hands, you know, <laughs> that don't come near me, Mr. The karate <laughs> hands, but, you know, Roper had the, the Tinkerbell mm -hmm. move and, you know, they, they would call him a fairy and stuff like that. And well, uh, even, even Jack with the snake hisses that, you know, it, when yeah. Roper would come, you know, that just looking back at that now, I think a lot of things that, that were on TV back then, I mean, you think about shows like the Jeffersons or uh, uh, Archie Bunker and the things mm -hmm. that they got away with. You would, I mean, the lawsuits would be all over the place now. You know, the the Facebook groups and all the hate and everything would be just insane. But it was a different time back then. And mm -hmm. even even though you had some strong female mom characters, we didn't have a lot of strong female like characters that could be emotional, but also had that strength. And the only one I could really think of would be Loretta Swit on Mash. And that was a show that was allowed to have a lot of male emotion. You think there were episodes where Hawkeye was just, you know, screaming and crying in some of those episodes that were really emotional. But apart from that, it seemed like it was more the I'm I'm a man kind of thing other than anything else, you know. Um, 
so John, uh, the next part uh, comes in. So after after you know Larry scares the hell out of Jack in the in the uh, the simulated flight, Terry comes out and she kind of protests the whole idea of taking any medication. But what I loved about this scene was that the way Jack gets away with keeping his his word to her, but also doing exactly the opposite is when she said, promise me you won't take one. And he goes, I won't take one. And then she walks off screen. I'll take two because that right. is another classic threes company move. I'm going to keep my word. I'm not going to lie to you. So you can't say I didn't later, but I'm also going to do exactly the opposite of what you're telling me at the same yeah, time. There's the loophole. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a, a classic threes company move. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and so, I'm, I'm yeah. kind of refreshing my memory. I've got the episode going on my phone as we discuss it. Just a couple additional humorous uh, out uh, elements of that first opening sequence is when they're sizing up Jack as to whether he's worthy of performing in this uh, this charade, and he's just coming out eating the banana while they're <laughs> you know sizing him up, almost as like. He's just like this, this, this ape that they're like trying to mold and form and get to do what he wants. He's just a big, dumb, brutish guy just chewing on a banana the whole time. <laughs> you know, I never thought about that, but there is yeah. a little bit of symbolism there, isn't there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, why, why else? Yeah, I don't see. That's the kind of thing that I, you can't convince me that that was random. That mm -hmm. I, I, I really think that there was. There's no other, there's no reason for him to be standing there eating a banana the whole time, you know? And I think right, it's, yeah. you know, almost, if anything, it's almost like reversing the roles and like the women are treating him as just some object that they're right. going to, you know, manipulate to, to, to their end game. Mm -hmm. And he's just standing there, you know, open, open mouth chewing on a banana, like a complete <laughs> fucking clod, you know, it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> you know and then larry comes in of course with with his you know uh form-fitting uh, kind of hawaiian purple and black uh shirt on white belt black uh slacks on yeah i tell you the, the, the larry dallas character is might be the most underrated character in all of sitcom history you know, I mean, people people talk a lot about uh, Herb Tarlick from WKRP because they went out of their way to dress him in ways that were completely obtuse. But I kind of think they did the same thing to Larry. It just was never pointed out. Whereas on WKRP, they actually used that in the show for some of the dialogue. But uh, on Three's Company, I mean, the, the style of clothing was really questionable back then anyway. But I think that they kind of just went out of their way to dress Larry up in some very tight jeans sometimes oh, and yeah. some really wild shirts. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think they did it with I, well, I mean, I know they did it with all the characters. Obviously, they did it with uh, with Chrissy to kind of boost her sex appeal and, you know, mm -hmm. show her sex appeal. But in the ways that they do it more subtly, there was another episode, which um, I think like when I was in the the middle of uh, th this kind of marathon of three's company. I texted you about it, Chris, the one where Jack goes to the dentist office. Oh yeah. And it was, um, it was, was it, Ter it was Terry's boyfriend. Right. And she wanted to break up with him. Yeah. Um, but um, at that point she's like, Jack had had a cavity and he wanted to go to the dentist. She goes, Oh, go to this, this guy that I'm seeing and he's great, but he winds up being a children's dentist and he doesn't know it until he gets there. But when Jack walks in, he's almost dressed up like a big child because he has on these shorts that are so short. Like, I mean, they're like a, like a two inch inseam or something. They could like, they're like nut huggers. They're like way up here. And he's like, yeah. he sits down on this little rocking horse with his knees, like, you know, almost yeah. up to his shoulders. And it's like, mm -hmm. you can't tell me that they didn't dress him like that in that scene on purpose to look more childlike. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Was that Jeffrey so, Tamper? That, yeah. That yeah. 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 With with a really bad rug um, <laughs> in that episode, if I can remember. But um, but I mean, I definitely think that a lot from from things as like I think obvious as that to things like we were talking about uh, with Larry kind of dressing it because he's also the womanizer, too. So they dressed him up really tight clothes, like 
low midriff shirts, like, uh, you know, is the, you know, one button to the navel with his chest hair hanging out and everything like really like, like sleazy, like the, the silk robes that he wore when he was trying to seduce women, yeah. you know, always, always, always is rocking some sort of gold necklace. Uh, yeah. Possibly, sometimes two or three layered yeah. up. Yeah. I mean, we, definitely on purpose. I always Definitely figured he purposeful. had like a, a round bed that had the remote control where you could just, you know, start it turning <laughs> with the mirrors yeah. over the top. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey Tambor, man, there's another just really superb actor who just has the ability to jump in and, and fill wherever he's needed. He was on a couple episodes of a show called The Practice, which was a, a legal show uh, mm -hmm. set in Boston. And man, he played a loan shark. It was the only time I've ever seen him play like a dark, evil character. And he was good. He was every bit as good as that as he was in comedy. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, uh, after the scene with Terry, the next scene is is Janet and Jack entering the party. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. They they cut uh cut to commercial, and then the next thing they do is um you see the the opulent party happening. Yeah. Doorbell rings, maid goes up, opens it up, and then there they are. Jack not and just, Janet. Not just a maid. This is the the classic Halloween costume, <laughs> you know, tr uh, trope of of what a maid would look like. It right. probably was I mean, back in that time. But what what gets me is that Janet, and, and again, suspension of belief, but you know, looking at it from the intellectual side, the whole way from the plane into the house, and I'm assuming that they landed at the house um janet is just starting to understand that something's wrong with jack where he had to have had that tranquilizer a while ago and yeah he's probably been a little bit loopy at some point but maybe she's just been really focused on you know maybe she's nervous about meeting this guy or whatever but it th those are points where i feel like things get a little bit forced because i'm sure she would have had to have noticed he was slurring his speech or just something wasn't yeah. right about him you know, well, I mean, there's again, it's this is Three's company and especially this episode is 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 the perfect vehicle for you to turn your brain off and not uh, like take your, the critical thinking lobe of your brain. Take a break. I'm watching Three's company right now. Exactly. Um, you know, another thing is uh, Jack's rolling into this party in a tuxedo. Does he own a tuxedo or he, he was able to rush out and rent a tuxedo? I mean, it, this this party happened this essentially the same day as all this was going on, right? Or did it I, I, no, I, no, I think it was the she said it was this weekend. So I don't know how close okay. the weekend was, but he might have had like a, a couple of days, maybe. I mean, if you if we're looking at it that way, but speaking of yeah, someone but, who has rented a tux in Los Angeles, I can say it is not always easy to get them that quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the other thing is, you know, keep in mind that this is a guy who had trouble month after month cobbling together a hundred dollars to pay his damn rent. You know, That's he's true. a guy like that. A doesn't own a tuxedo, so you can pretty much safely uh, assume that he's renting it. And uh, you you would have to assume that you know he he got probably got Janet to pay for it since she was always gainfully employed and he wasn't. And, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, that, that's the other thing is just, he, he comes bounding it while well, not bounding. He just kind of, kind of slinks into this party and you realize it's uh, that's when you realize that it's, it really is this, this highfalutin party. Cause she's got this, uh, you know, kind of, unfortunate off the shoulder prom dress you know this powder blue <laughs> thing and then he's rocking a tuxedo and then you know again that's that's when you know that your critical thinking starts to kick in and that's when you just gotta you gotta put it at bay and just be take it at face value right i, I will say uh in general i think they did a good a, a really good job with wardrobe on the show but whoever picked that dress for janet i i have to seriously disagree with that a cocktail dress would have been better um maybe just something simple and black but that dress was it was just too poofy in the sleeves it looked incredibly uncomfortable yeah. i don't know any man even in the 70s or, or early 80s that would have been like wow i want her yeah <laughs> wearing that thing you know uh this this party though i have to say to me was so well done from from the time they walk in to the time it they flash back to the apartment at the end 
this is choreographed like a Cirque du Soleil show. I mean, it was so beautifully done. I don't know if they had uh, episodic uh, awards back then, but I would have certainly put this one up for vote if there was anything. Um, you guys are are really familiar with this, so I'm just kind of going to let you guys um, jump in and, and walk through it. But we'll just we'll just start with them walking in the door and Jack already not looking right. No, he is not. Uh, I mean, he starts right away with the with the physical comedy going down the stairs. And then when they're done with the stairs, he just keeps going down, um, which is, you know, the first the hilarious thing that he does. Yeah. Um, then uh, if I'm not wrong, they're greeted by uh, David and mm -hmm. um, we think his we think his girlfriend, but it's really his sister, Nancy. Right. So there's the big misunderstanding. Like nobody says anything like he says to bring a date and they pretend that they're in love and everything. He and he has the he has the gall to act like he's confused. He's just like, why is Janet all over this guy? And he's just kind of like, um, OK. And uh, she's just like, well, Jack really wanted to go to Acapulco this weekend, but uh, we decided to come here instead. And I'm like, bitch, you work in a flower shop and you think that he's going to believe that you have enough money to go to Acapulco. Well, and, and why wouldn't you say uh, if he was interested at all in Janet? I mean, he must have been because he invited her to the party. But right. at the same point, wouldn't you make sure that she knew that was your sister and not have that misunderstood? But, but again, you would have no show without right without that happening. I mean, he said later, like, "Oh, I didn't, I didn't tell you. You know, we didn't. I, you know." So maybe in the the confusion of introductions with Jack acting so uh, like off the wall and loopy that maybe he thought that he mentioned it, but he didn't. So you could probably explain it that way. Yeah. But um, so they, they established that, you know, they're going to go their ways. I know that he, he's trying to get Janet to uh, show her around and uh, you know, Jack is meeting people, but he's, he remembers he's got to keep his promise not to say that he's a chef. So the first couple of people they meet, like uh, what is it, an investment banker and, and something else, they have these really highfalutin jobs. So what does Jack come out with? He says he's he's a Jesuit priest. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. So Which, specific. <laughs> but what, what I didn't realize was, is that's a call back to the novel that Terry was reading at the very beginning of the episode. I, oh. I thought that that was oh, really, yeah. that that was really random. But when he first came in and he said, and he was talking to Terry at the very beginning of the episode, he's, and she wasn't paying attention to him. She goes, oh, I'm really into this book. And he goes, well, what's it about? And she says, it's about a Jesuit priest who forsakes his his true love and works with uh, the the downtrodden and the poor and it's a really throwaway line but if you remember it later on he's probably thinking to himself well how can i seem like a really like like a really great person to these people i'll say i'm a jesuit priest because they'll think that i that i forsake my true love and help downtrodden people <laughs> And I didn't even realize that until the again, the last time that I watched the episode. And when she said Jesuit priest, it just like immediately clicked in my mind. And I'm like, he said that later. So oh, great catch. Yeah. And yeah. It, it was still hilarious because somebody, I think Janet spit her drink out when he said that, which is another classic comedy trope. You know, somebody says something outrageous and you just spit your drink all over the place and nobody seems to care. You know, <laughs> right, right. Now you know, nobody's wiping, like... nobody's wiping it off, or being like, "Oh, you, you gross pig," or anything. Yeah. It just, you know, it just happens. Yeah. Nowadays, so... somebody would be posting the video on Instagram, and you know, figuring out which hashtags to use. But... Uh, I, I think too that that had it not been for the tranquilizer, he would have come up with a story and would have stuck to it because I think he's got that intelligence. He would have said, OK, I'm going if I can't be a chef, then I'm going to be an investment banker and just stick with that one story, something that was plausible, something he could speak to with intelligence. But again, tranquilizer. So now it's just everybody he meets, he's somebody different. Well, yeah, now this is the beginning of his making up crazy occupations for himself, which is is fantastic. Yeah, so. he's, a, he's a congressman to that old couple. And, uh, <laughs> you know, just uh, it go, go the list goes on and on. She was another great guest too. I, I really enjoyed her as a party goer, the way that she interacted, and yeah. um, I, even the physical comedy side of it. You know, you you don't really expect them to to older people to do much, but even from a physical side, I thought she was great. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna let you guys take it because you you can roll through this better than I can. So, Chris, do you want to take it from there? Yeah, I mean, you know, he's he's just 
basically meeting all the party goers and you know he's he's out uh they eventually end up going out on the balcony and then uh you know the just at some point the music starts and that's when the dancing kicks in and like you said with the with the old lady um that's you know, the best she, he he just he yells out strut with me mama and just grabs her and they just <laughs> go dancing back into the party and that's when the whole sequence takes off and uh and you know up up until that point well actually before that point was when you know those two like really good looking guys they met earlier the one of them gives them the uh you know the drink what do you call it the rocket the red the rocket. rocket the red yeah. rocket yeah which One I mean, do we of, do we even know what that is? I don't know. It's almost like because it, it turned it certainly hit him like it was a stimulant, and uh, I don't mm-hmm. I, you know I don't think like the whole energy drink Red Bull type thing was even happening back then. But no, uh, that was years before energy drinks would be. A, yeah. A thing. So I mean, you assume it's a, 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 a an alcoholic beverage, but uh, that's not how that stuff hits you and they what did he say it's one sip and you blast off and (laughs) you know back in the day who knows he maybe just uh you know sprinkled a little uh little uh little nose whiskey into there and uh and that was the secret ingredient who knows well it was the the mid 80s and i would say there's a good chance of that but i also think too it's interesting that they picked a drink that was related to flight you hmm. think rocket flight? He was afraid okay. of flying, and and you know, there's. I think there's like a, a subconscious tie in there as well. I didn't think of yeah. that. Now, how did yeah, he? Anything's possible. I don't think. I don't. Th- I think very few things, if any, were were done by accident throughout yeah. the run of the show. Now, how did he end up behind the bar before the dance started? Because I can't remember how he got there. Jack. Yeah. Oh well, he well that was after the dance. He fell behind the bar. That's oh, later. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But um the um the the one thing that I um or one thing I remember is when he first told the the two good looking guys that he was the Jesuit priest, there was one thing that was never really explained. They kind of looked at him like they raised their eyebrow and they're like they kind of gave him this look like, yeah, sure, uh, we're going to go get a drink. Like they they kind of were like, yeah, you're full of shit. We're getting out of here. And I always thought that was really interesting because everybody else seemed to believe him about all the crazy stuff. Like he told David he was a doctor, a brain surgeon, um, and he had surgery in the morning. And even David was just like, yeah, OK, whatever. The only person that seemed impressed by his fake occupation was the old lady when he told her that he was a congressman. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I like that. We were going to go to uh, on a different vacation and we came to your party instead. But he also had surgery in the morning. So <laughs> how is that going to work? <laughs> you know? That's true. That's but I also true. like how the old lady didn't even resist. She just kind of like, all right, well, I guess you're just going to dance with me and you're going to lead. So she, she wasn't like, Hey, don't touch me. Or what are you doing? Or like no protest whatsoever. And she loved it. Yeah. She was, she was just probably happy. Somebody was giving her some action. 